Last week, we peered through the keyhole of the new heaven, rather like a butler, and glimpsed the angels playing their harpsichords. We had a brief vista of heaven, something of a cross between a, a premier lodge and a Christian Jurassic Park, in which we have the whole of eternity to try to remember our room number. If you're awake, if as Jesus says you have ears, then you'll have noted that I playfully threw a spanner into the pigeons by saying that the angels play harpsichords. They may or may not. They do play harps. This is a known, unassailable fact. Not so much from the Bible, but from the internet. It is worth noting, though, that the word harp is mentioned in the Bible 30 times. It is seen as an instrument of praise before God Almighty, unlike the recorder. If heaven is filled with the tuneful wafts of harps being played by angels or other creatures with wings, like Paul McCartney, then hell is surely full of tormented souls squeaking out three blind mice on recorders. There is only one instance in the Bible of a recorder. 2 Samuel 8 verse 16 says, Joab, son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Alihud, was a recorder. There is a sermon in that verse alone, I'm certain, but it is not for today. What I wish to explore today, friends, is that enigma of the future, the concept that there is to be a new heaven and a new earth. If our belief is that when we die we're going to heaven, then it leads us to wonder why there needs to be a new earth as well as a new heaven. After all, if we are in heaven, who will be on the new earth? I feel we could explore this profound enigma in one of two ways. We could either approach it by a process of learned study reading the scriptures and prayerfully considering the written wisdom of the saints through the ages, or we could leave it until it comes round next time in the lectionary in three years' time. I opt for the latter. But as a taster, as a prequel to that sermon which I pray someone else has the good fortune to deliver, I wish to momentarily consider one aspect of life on this new earth, a land where milk and honey flows rather like a collision of trolleys in Tesco. The aspect I refer to is the mobile phone. Mobile phones will surely be a feature of the new earth. But the flawed technology we know today will be made perfect by Grace, where Grace is the chief technologist at my imaginary mobile phone company of the future. The major flaw that seems apparent to me, but not to the mobile phone man manufacturers or network companies, is that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone on one mobile phone to manage a full, unbroken conversation with someone on another mobile phone. Mobile signals are so variable and erratic, interrupted by a tree or a dip, a gust of wind or the waft of a butterfly's wing, that it stands to reason that if you are moving, you will at some point on your journey encounter a butterfly's wing on a tree in a windy dip such as sour cream and chive, and the chance is doubled if the other person is also moving. To be honest, it's my view that there ought to be some kind of statement, a disclaimer in the mobile phone booklet, which advises that the best chance of having any kind of phone call with this contraption is to be indoors, seated, maybe in your house or your work desk, and keep perfectly still, 
and talk to someone on their mobile phone who is equally in their home or desk and sitting still as well. And therefore, an improvement to this technology in the new Earth might be to have some kind of, I don't know, wire in some way connecting the two phones, possibly fibre optic. Maybe the handsets could somehow be ergonomically designed to have the gentle curve to fit the shape of a human hand. Many people have more than one mobile phone, of course. They have their own phone, and they have a work phone, and they probably have a variety of other obsolete phones in a drawer. They will certainly have a variety of other obsolete mobile phone chargers in a drawer in the vain hope that one day they may come in useful or they can take them along to Antiques Roadshow 2099 and an expert will peer over his or her half moon spectacles and scratch his or her head and rub his or her moustache and say in hushed tones you know, I've not seen one of these for a long, long time. And I have to say, it is utterly, utterly worthless. Of course, our old mobile phones can be used. They can be recycled. They will be sent to Africa or somewhere similar like Kenya where there is evidently a better signal than the place you live. Unfortunately, although this lucky African boy has a new mobile phone to play with, he can't use it because the charger for it is in a drawer in your house. Therein lies the flaw of human wisdom, the folly of our systems. Jesus Far from being oblivious to the concepts and science behind mobile phones, is in fact the one who takes away the sims of the world. But now we reach the central point of what I have discovered and which I wish to impart to you today. A nugget of revelation about the gospel and the link between mobile phone technology and this new earth in which we shall live. For today, we shall explore the Christian concept of Bluetooth. This may sound like a joke, and entirely fictitious, like Sherlock Holmes or Angela Rippon. But I assure you, the character I am about to talk about is as real as Madrid and as kosher as chicken tikka masala. I am no friend of computers or the internet myself, as you know, but Sandra, my wife, virtually lives in the Amazon, and while there, she made a fascinating discovery, rather like when Charles Darwin discovered America. King Harold Bluetooth of Denmark reigned from 958 AD. Yes, his name really was Harold Bluetooth, or more properly, Harold Blutand Gormson. Blutand translates as Bluetooth, and son denotes just that, son of. Thus, Gormson is literally son of Gorm. Johnson means son of John. Erickson means son of Eric. Venison is the name of a boy conceived in Venice. Crimson is a boy who gets into trouble with the law. Hudson is a youth in a shopping centre. Unison is a young man studying for a degree. Watson is asking your boy to repeat the question. Bison is bidding your son au revoir. Arson is when you say with irritation, stop being an arson. Harold Blutand Bluetooth Gormson, son of King 
Gorm. Moreover, friends, he was son of King Gorm the Old, otherwise known as Gorm the Sleepy. Since the habit of giving surnames was not in common practice until the mid-19th century in Denmark, nicknames were often used in conjunction with a person's real name. And sometimes <laughs> the nickname was the playful opposite of the truth. King Gorm the Sleepy may in fact suggest that King Gorm was in fact very alert. Harold Bluetooth may in truth have had perfectly white teeth. So what better playful nickname to give someone with perfectly white teeth than Bluetooth? Danish humour. Not having a formal surname would make it particularly difficult in a domestic setting when you would normally use your child's full name on those occasions when you want to communicate that the last chance is nearing and you are growing rather impatient. Imagine the difficulty then for early Danes standing at the foot of the stairs and shouting, Gorm! Come down, please. Gorm, don't make me cross now. Gorm the sleepy, you are in big trouble, mister. It doesn't really work as the precursor to the naughty step. Harold Blutand Gormson. Harold Bluetooth Gormson. Became king. King of Denmark. Just imagine how proud he must have felt. In fact, shamefully ignorant on facts about Denmark, I found some information entitled 29 Little Known Facts About Denmark. And the first few read as follows. Fact 1. In Denmark, it rains every second day. Well, that sounds promising at first. At least you know what day to hang your washing out or have a barbecue. But I think it's just an average. Fact two. There is usually a brisk breeze blowing in Denmark. The average wind speed is 7.6 metres per second. Fact three. If you buy a boat in Copenhagen and sail to the nearest shore on the other side of the water, you arrive in Sweden. This struck me as an interesting fact, friends, because it implies you can't actually rent a boat in Copenhagen. The implication may be that they used to rent boats in Copenhagen, but since everyone just used them to sail to Sweden and not bring them back, they just decided to sell them instead. Harold Bluetooth Gormson married Girid Olaf's daughter. Daughter meaning daughter. So Olaf's daughter means Olaf's daughter. Harold and Girid had four children together, but none with a more amusing surname than their beloved son, Sven Forkbeard. Yes, truly the son of Harold Bluetooth was Sven Forkbeard. You know, a nickname presumably grows on an individual, acquired later in life. After all, it would be presumptuous to give your infant the name of Forkbeard. But as they grow and take a keen interest in hiding bits of cutlery in their beard, I imagine it's not long before a nickname develops naturally. Harold Bluetooth presents to us an iconic but unexpected image of the new earth. He, in his reign, having been converted and baptised by none other than Popo the monk, he brought dissonant tribes together in Denmark, Norway and Sweden. Moreover, not only did he unite factions, he also brought them to faith 
through the gospel. And it was in fact this act of unification based on the glue of a common belief and faith that led to Ericsson naming their wireless invention in honour of him, whereby disconnected devices can be brought into unity. This technology we are now so familiar with, where people can walk along the road seemingly talking to themselves, and your mobile phone can talk to your toaster, and without you even knowing about it, is actually an indirect recognition of the unity that the gospel of Christ brings. And thus it gives us a technological glimpse to the new earth. Of course, it is fortunate in many ways that this unity was brought about by Harold Bluetooth and not by his son, Sven Forkbeard. It may have been so different, with people saying, oh yes, this mobile phone has got all the latest connectivity, linking effort effortlessly to your computer by the miracle of Forkbeard. Actually, you couldn't just fork beard that picture over to me, could you? Christians, Jesus is the Bluetooth of the church, bringing the different parts of the body together as one. Jesus is the Bluetooth in the world, where one day every knee shall bow, that is, on the new earth. Jesus is the Bluetooth in the whole of creation, the word by which the universe was made. We may not understand the distinction between the new heaven and the new earth, but we know that when the Bible talks about all being one in Christ Jesus, it is, without realising it, speaking of Bluetooth technology. Amen. <laughs>